welcome. I don't know how many we've got on the call tonight, but I can see uh, we're quite represented from uh, around the Northern American continent. So uh, good, what would it be over there? Good afternoon to you. Good evening from, from England and Liverpool here. I hope you're all well. Um, I guess probably I should uh, explain some of the context behind this. So Sean got in touch with me and asked, it would help if I shared my screen here, wouldn't it? Here we go. I'm one of those people that, as you'll notice, that has about a thousand internet window tabs up, which is very bad for productivity. There we go. That, I think that's working now. Let's present and there we are. Yeah. So hopefully you can you can see that the uh, putting slides together isn't a great strength of mine. Um, but yeah, Sean contacted me a while ago and asked if I would come on and uh, talk to or do you know do, talk to you guys just about coach development. And then when it, push came to shove and it was well, we want you to do a presentation. I, I kind of pushed back a bit and said, well, I don't really do presentations, and and I don't, as Sean mentioned, my my job is a, a coach developer, so spend a lot of time out on the grass in classrooms working one-to-one -one or in group settings with coaches but I guess we're moving away from the days of kind of traditional chalk and talk stand at the front with dozens of slides and reel them out to you I think in this day and age as well I guess the the purpose behind those uh, is becoming less and less now we're becoming more and more connected so um this I thought, well, what am I going to do here? It's just a bit, a bit daunting because I don't really have anything off the shelf. And then I realised that 2019, which seems a long time ago now, I, I finished a, a master's degree in sports coaching that was uh, brilliantly put together with the University of Worcester and the Football Association. So it took us over, over three years to do. And the this uh, lengthy academically worded title is the resulting um, thesis, if you like, or the independent study that I did over the, the course of last year. And what, it, uh, what I'll go through is, if I can get this to work, there we go. Um, I'll go through the context and the rationale. So, you know, why did I choose this study? What did, what did we actually do? Or what did I actually do? How did I analyze the data? Um, and explain the results, conclusions, and, and so what. There's a few caveats, really, though. Um, and apologies to any sociologists, academics uh, on the webinar. I am not an expert in anything, and I'm definitely not an expert researcher. This is my debut uh, having a go at research, which, if any of you have done uh, academic research before, is can be extremely messy which I found out but that's part of the enjoyment I guess um, so there is fraught with bias I'm involved in football uh, here in the northwest of England um, in, a, in a professional and a voluntary capacity uh, the sample itself I'll explain a little bit more about that but it's quite a small sample so don't be drawing too many concrete conclusions from what I'm about to present to you but what I really want to do is hopefully stimulate some thoughts and I really, really want to encourage some disagreement and some debate. The, the presentation I don't envisage lasting so long. It was uh, something that I did at the um, Cluster for Research into Coaching Conference back in September uh, in Worcester. And the presentation itself only lasted about 10 minutes or so, but I think the important bit will be what the, the so what, what does this mean for us? Um, so I'll, I'll get into it anyway, and hopefully we can generate some good questions and and some good discussion and debate afterwards. So northwest of England, specifically where I live, there is we have quite a lot of leagues, and what I mean, youth leagues. So organisations that um, run football or competitive football experiences for um, children right up to adults. So if you look. On, a, on any given Saturday, if, if you and your team was lifted over here, you, you would have the choice of perhaps 19 different leagues that you could apply to and, and join, which has its pros and cons. In, in some respects, it means that the leagues have to try and offer uh, a good service because there's competition from the organisation down the road. So we can't just treat our, our clubs and teams 
poorly because there's there's other alternatives but on the flip side of that what it does do is dilute the talent uh, right across so you instead of it, so let's take the the opposite end of the spectrum to this if there was only one league you would have every team in the local area bunched together and um, the talent would I guess find a natural hierarchy uh, that it could play against so the, what I really wanted to get into is to understand better what teenagers feel about football and, and competition um, because that's a word that has been muddied somewhat over the last 10 15 years certainly that I've worked in football it's it's almost become a bit of a tab taboo the word competition and competitive football and I uh, haven't had some some of the best times of my life on a football field um, in competitive situations I, I find that hard to agree with so I really wanted to, to to dig into what do the teenagers of today around here in this real what is a football hotbed in the north of northwest of England what do they feel about competition and, and what do they want about competition and what are the what are the elements within competition that are important to them and, and to dig into that so being a somebody who facilitates conversations a lot at work in my day job I thought that a focus group would be the best way to go in terms of the methods so what I did was uh, I, I ran a, a pilot study with the, the team that I coach you at the time last year were under 15s and it was if you do if you take nothing else from from tonight I would just encourage you to to run something akin to a, a focus group it doesn't have to be so formal but with your if you coach players the just having the opportunity to sit down with the the boys that I coach and ask and some questions and really encourage them to speak openly and honestly was one of the best things that I, I got out of this and it had really you know it had some impact on the research but much more impact on my own coaching so after learning quite a lot and how poor I am at, at hosting focus groups with with teenagers after the first pilot um, it was back to the drawing board a little bit and I came up with some what were task-based focus groups and the reason why I wanted task-based I don't know if you can see the image on the right there but that that is um, or indeed if you know who they are there that's Kevin and Perry they are from a TV series here in the UK I don't know if you've got it out in the States called Harry Enfield but basically they Kevin and Perry play two kind of um, stereotypical teenagers when any question that they're asked they just respond with a, a grunt and that is exactly what I was worried about going into these focus groups that I would just ask these these boys a question about football and the kind of response might be yeah okay whatever um, so I'd, I'd done some reading and found that tasks are, are quite a good way to stimulate discussion and conversation so you can see there the, the tasks uh, what there were two two particular tasks the first well the first thing I did was print out the uh, all the results from that current season that the boys and the teams had just played in just to kind of stimulate some memory about uh, the games that they played in and then you'll see two set two decks of cards there so one deck of cards there were three cards one says hard opponent one says equal opponent and one says easy opponent and then the second deck of cards there um, was around certainty so uncertain underdog uncertain favorite certain loss certain win so they they would I'll, and i'll come on to what uh, how we use those those tasks um, in a moment. So three under 15s teams locally here. Uh, important to note, there was a quite a wide range of ability. So although they were only maybe two divisions apart, that um, we had a real range of win loss records. So there was one team who um, had only won a handful of games in the last say six years. Uh, there was one team who a lot of the boys have been in and around academy football who you know really um, really good players um, but had a quite a neutral win-loss record um, and then one team who had a really high win-loss record so they they were consistently at the top of their their division or they, they were for the season that they just played in anyway so we got I, I thought I got quite a nice uh, range of experiences um, that that the boys had played in so um, recorded these focus groups and started to analyze the data which was which was basically the airpods that i've got on at the moment 
put uh, recording the conversations on the phone and and walking and listening and just taking notes and and seeing what um what comes back it's funny what happens when you listen back to conversations and what you take from them the second and third time round but basically we, we without getting too too jargony or too technical i went through uh what's called a thematic analysis so taking what, what was there 84 pages of transcripts and 26,000 words and starting to just pull out little quotes and and tag them I, I would say um, th th this is where the kind of researchers who are maybe on the call will start tearing their hair out at my sloppiness here but basically just looking at all these all these quotes and just adding tags to them and then clustering these tags um, and keep going through this kind of pruning process until you arrive at the final results which were um, four key themes if you like and th those four themes uh, were challenge proving pressure and fairness so i'll talk a little bit about what was uh, within those themes now so as you can see from the from the cards there what the results in, within the challenge theme were that um and this th some of these might surprise us some of these results might kind of uh, make us think they might sting a little bit but uh, this is what this group or the, the these three groups of, uh, of teenagers here in the northwest of England were saying about football so the, the the when I asked them to put to rank in order who they would prefer to play hard opponent would consistently came out at the top so they wanted this challenge um, and the the other consistent one was that they put easy opponent straight to the bottom so tell us in order who do you prefer to play and put those cards in the order you know when you get up on a saturday morning who do you want to play against and consistently they they want to play against hard opponents and the reason is because they want to be tested and they want to be challenged and on the flip side of that so they they don't they don't like uh games where uh they they win too easy so for example if you get a, a whitewash score line it, it's it's really frowned upon thing in terms of what the teenagers are, are saying to us so although it might feel good for us adults you know coming away with a nice 10 nil 15 nil victory actually and you can look at sport often and certainly football is a what's called a zero-sum game so for your team to if, if your team was playing my team if your team wins my team loses so that's what's called a zero-sum game but the results of of this study certainly would suggest that a, a whitewash in terms of what young people feel about the game is a, is a lose-lose negative sum game that nobody really benefits and actually the apathy for uh, playing a really mismatched opponent a really weaker opponent it was coming through very strong so there's this kind of um, a, a striving to play a hard opponent but not too hard if you like so they don't want they want tough challenging games but not where it's a, a complete whitewash and these results can be extended to leagues as well as individual matches so we got talking about formats and competitions one of the teams had actually played i think uh one or two games to reach a divisional cup final and it, it they it really wasn't a big deal to them so to the adults it might be a big thing that we you know we get the ribbons out we 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 get the, um, the the big ground to play the the big main event out, but what the teenagers were saying is we you know we didn't really do much to get there. We didn't really feel that we'd achieve much. It wasn't much of a challenge to get to the final, so therefore it didn't really um, bear bear much significance or meaning to them. So that's that's something to think about in terms of the the formats of competition that that we offer young people is how to what extent do they offer a, a realistic challenge and how challenging are they over time so the next theme was i i called it proving and this was quite surprising actually but then when you look at the the, the past research it, it it made some sense so there was this kind of tribal identity that where you uh, you had these teams who one of the real drivers um, for for winning and and winning is important to them but not as much as as the challenge so i should have noted that in the previous slide actually that yes these these boys do want to win but they prefer to to be challenged at first so proving 
they they want to prove them to themselves that they're up to the task and they they enjoy proving others wrong and when you think about it this makes complete sense because adolescence is a real time uh, where belonging to a group is is very important and you're a, a, a sporting group a a team sports team that you you belong to in adolescence might just be one of the most important things that you groups that you belong to so this this offered some light uh, uh, as to why a lot of the boys had selected this hard opponent to play against because they enjoyed the opportunity to kind of punch up and to to prove the 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 others wrong who might have doubted them so that that was quite an interesting concept but the the worry is sometimes that we we try and create these strong uh, identities within our own clubs and our own teams and what a lot of the evidence has shown is that the stronger the kind of team identity so the more that I feel for the team and the club the more likely I am as an adolescent to to be antisocial towards opposition so that it's almost a double-edged sword really we're trying to create strong bonds within the within our teams and our clubs but those strong bonds are often associated with with bad behavior externally so that, that's something for us to to remember as as coaches when we are trying to connect with and amongst our players so the third theme was pressure and this was cited as a reason why some of the some of the boys had dropped out or some of them had moved teams or changed clubs was the adults had put too much pressure on on these boys to win so remember i mentioned that winning you know was important to some of them um but challenge was more important but when when the pressure to win comes from adults and these young people don't feel like that they've got the skills to cope that that turns into a quite a negative experience quite quickly but pressure isn't all bad i don't want to you know label this as as, as good and bad so when you when you delve into it there is an optimum amount of pressure that these teenagers do enjoy but the key thing is that it's regulated by them so they they feel the pressure as a collective rather than an individual so you'll see some of the quotes there that it, they're very much about the we rather than the me and when these teenagers found themselves in in situations where perhaps the it was getting close to the end of the game the outcome was on the line it was really tough conditions there was something riding on the game a lot of them spoke really vividly and, and, and quite favorably about these moments. So a colleague of mine, Dave Piggott, who you know, is, is much more experienced and, and has way more knowledge than I do about this sort of stuff. He's, he's worth going down a rabbit hole on his research. He calls this clutch states. So it could be like the last 10 minutes of the game. Um, the scores are level. Uh, we, we've just had a player sent off and it's really back to the wall. And, um, we might need these points or to, to avoid relegation or whatever it may be. Um, but the, these moments, and I, I, I bet if you thought about some of the um, most enjoyable sporting experiences that you've ever had, they were probably quite close, uncertain uh, moments, maybe where the outcome of a game is on the line. So you'll see the cards there. We, to frame up this, um, or, or one of the tasks that, that led to this result was, so with those four cards, you've got the um, uncertain underdog, uncertain favourite, certain loss and certain win. The, the task was, on your own, just rank those in order. When you wake up on the Saturday morning that you play your games, who do you prefer to be as your team? Um, and then we'll discuss those. So I guess if you, if you were to do that with your players, what might you think that they would come up with? Um, so you'll see maybe the surprising one there was certain win was picked bottom quite a lot. The consistency here is that the, the two uncertain cards came out on top for everyone and the two certain cards came out on top, uh, sorry, came out bottom for everyone. So that led to some really good debate and discussion as to, to you know, why, what, what led behind those answers. And, you know, uncertainty of outcome is one of the key drivers that makes competition exciting. So and you can think about this when you take it back to your own days, maybe in the schoolyard when you played games that were unregulated by the adults. Um, what would you do? You would pick teams 
often so that they would be the most equal that they could be. Why would you do that? Because you want the outcome of that game over that lunchtime to be as uncertain as possible. And then if the scoreline started getting out of hand, what you would often do is mix the team rounds, maybe swap the best players over so that you would kind of restore that competitive balance. Because although we're, we're going through a global pandemic right now and, and uncertainty is, is one of the scariest things, in a sporting context, uncertainty is one of the most exciting things. And how often do we as adults arrange um, fixtures between groups of young people's teams because the spreadsheet says that we have to? when we know fine well that when those two play against each other, there's such a mismatch that there is no uncertainty of outcome, that everybody knows what the outcome of that game is going to be before the two teams uh, set foot onto the pitch. And I think we need to try and question that more and, and move away from that because it's, it's really not what fun or competition is or should be about. So the last theme in the results was, a, was one called fairness. So one of the things that, I was interested to find out what was um, how these boys felt about something called competitive engineering. So you'll know what this is naturally. Uh, golf has it, um, it's boxing does. Um, golf uses a handicap system, boxing uses weight classes. Uh, you would never put in boxing a heavyweight up against a, a, a flyweight, but we seem to do that a lot in youth sports, in, in team sports as well, or in, in certainly in my sport, football. So. Um, I was interested to find out how these young people would feel about competitive engineering in a, in a football context. So some of you might have seen things like uh, power play, whereby if a team is winning by X amount of goals, the, the opposition can bring on another player, um, or if there is some kind of scoreline handicap system. But with, with these teenagers, a, a lot of those things were, were really dismissed. Interestingly, a lot of these boys played in an unregulated or unaffiliated uh, local league on a, uh, a Friday evening that isn't sanctioned by the, the Football Association. There's no adult involvement in that league other than uh, the referee and the person who collects the money. So they go down, it's almost like a youth club type thing. Uh, they run themselves and they play uh, often teams older or younger by up to four years. Um, it, it is carnage by the sounds of it. I haven't been to see it myself, but it reminds me of when I used to play at that age myself informally. We, we've got kind of strict regulations, certainly in this country and I think in, in America as well, in terms of who qualifies for what age group. So often you'll have a, a, a date line cut off and that those born post that day qualify for this age group. And that's traditionally the way that we've always done it. Now, here in England, you can play up an age group, but you can't play down an age group. And that can be quite a challenge to some of our late developers. So this was something that was discussed in the focus groups and it was mixed feelings really, potentially because it's so new and it's not something that's been done before. It's, you know, how would you feel about uh, playing up or even players playing down in your age group? Um, again, mixed, mixed views. But one thing that uh, did come out quite strongly was that um, this view of meritocracy within youth sport. So I'll hold my hands up. I've, I've been coaching the team who I coach now. They're under 16s since they were under 10. And until the last year or so, I would say that the playing time that I give has been um, egalitarian. So everyone gets the same amount of minutes, which is a lot easier to do when the, when the players are younger because you've got less injuries and things like that, less complications to deal with smaller squad numbers. But that's been the principle that I've worked off is, um, e you know, equal playing time for all. But since doing this research and listening to the teenagers, what and, and when you look back into um, child development, so there's a, a guy called Jean Piaget, who's quite famous in terms of his work in, in child development. He suggests that... Uh, children start life with a very uh, kind of a meritocracy view of fairness that everyone's equal and everyone should receive the same outcome. But as they develop more towards adolescence, they move towards more of a meritocratic view of fairness. So in other words, if you've, if you've put more effort in, then you should get more um, back out. So I started to explore this with the teenagers in terms of 
um, you know, what, what did it mean to them? And, and, you know, a lot of them think that uh, playing time, for example, shouldn't just be a given. So if you're the best player in the squad and you just turn up to trading and you, you're not particularly trying, then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the best player, you shouldn't be getting as much playing time as somebody who's perhaps trying harder. So th- this really kind of opened my mind. And what it did is it led to some really good and healthy discussions about how would I or how would we as a team go on uh, with managing playing time? So we looked at you know commitment to turning up to training um, week in, week out, um, turning up on time, things that are, are well within the player's control often, um, just effort that the, the players are, are putting in. So, and that was, was, well, until everything shut down with the pandemic, I, I felt has led to a much healthier um, motivational climate within the squad where, uh, you know, there's more of a sense of autonomy and control over, if I want more playing time, it's within my grasp. It doesn't uh, hinge on whether I'm the best player in the squad or not. And that traditionally is what we've, um, whether we like to admit it or not, a lot of us will often give that, that playing time to the the, the better players, um, you know, if we admit it, because the, the adults want to win the game. So um, I, I would, yeah, I would urge you to kind of have those discussions with your players and, and find out what does, what you know, what does fairness mean to them in terms of the way that you run your own teams. So what, what were the conclusions from all this? I think that we've got to, re-examine the, the, the phrase non-competitive. I don't think it's particularly helpful. It kind of pushes things on a, um, a you're either in this camp on, or, or this camp and sport it, itself is inherently competitive. You know, some of us now could um, jump on a Zoom call and have a keep you up challenge. We would turn it into a competition. So I think we've got to almost uh, look at how we can get competitive and healthy back on on the agenda together because um like i said earlier it's been a bit of a taboo for for a while now um perhaps we need to look at the rules and how we qualify players for certain age groups so this is something that has never really been challenged too much and there isn't a lot of research out there that that looks at certainly not in a um a non-elite uh context that looks at the impact of perhaps playing down. I know there's some countries over here in Europe that, that do allow that. Um, we, we really need to give more of a voice and a choice to the young people who are, who are competing. And it is the young people that are competing, not the adults. So um, you know, one of the proposals that I've made is that every league in, in the local area, every organisation that offers competition for young people should, have a, a, should be represented by the young people. So either a separate committee or a re- or a sole representative on the on the main board. So we've got to really start to engage with and and, and listen to young people uh, because it's you know it is their game, it's their competition. And and there is a lot of organisations out there that, that are starting to do this and having some really good um, uh, outcomes off the back of it. Uh, I think that we also need to think about the expertise that we have on our sporting organisation boards. So if you've got a, a league who are running competition locally, often it's it's well-meaning volunteers who might not have um, the necessary experience or, or understanding of um, youth maturation and growth. So I think we need to really engage and reach out to make sure that our committees and boards are, are, are properly represented. I've put there bigger is better and I added a question mark because I don't think there's too many things which kind of go in a, in a linear fashion like that. I, I spoke at the start about locally here we've got lots and lots of youth leagues which does mean that we've got to and I sit on the committee of one we have to provide a good service otherwise we'll lose teams but I think that there is um there is an argument for bigger is better. So bigger uh, youth leagues, give you, they give you more options in terms of how you match teams and how you can be a little bit more creative within, the com- uh, you know, within competitive formats that you offer. So traditionally, what we've done over here is start in September, finish in May, just like the adults do. But, you know, young people, you, you, some of you have got children, some of them might well have played a whole season on FIFA today. 
So we, we've got to, I think, put out there competitive formats and experiences that reflect the, what motivates and excites these young people when it comes to football. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope it's made you think. I hope it's um, created some questions and, and comments and discussion and debate. And yeah, over to you, Sean. I, I'll, I'll pause for a second, have a drink. Perfect. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, I actually had a couple of questions and I'm sure we're going to get some more coming in as we go. So um, we'll get started with those. I guess the first one that I would have for you in this is on the basis of your research and your findings, um, what did you change personally when it came to coaching the players on the field with this I guess, insight into their behaviours and, and what they wanted to see from the game? So with your organisation, did you make any significant changes yourself? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, whew, I've never been asked that before, but I think I, I'm a big uh, subscriber or a big fan of a, a guy called Jean Cote. So he's done a load of research into youth sport. And one of the things that he talks about in terms of the role of the coach is he's, he has a four C's system. So um, your role as a coach is to uh, develop your players' competence, confidence, connection and character and just by initially doing the, the pilot focus group with the boys I coach I felt really opened the door and, and connected us more and then transcribing and, and reading and listening back and going through these and um, these quotes um, which you know after a few months of sitting at a laptop going through this process uh, they they really start to have an Im impact on your way of thinking. So it really got me thinking about everything that I do and uh, everything that we are as a group um, and how do we do things. So the, the playing time one is probably the, the biggest example. And, uh, you know, it, I, I actually you know, sat down and said, uh, have we got this right? You know, is this the way that you, you want things, you know, the way that we do it? And it was like, well, it might be a little bit better of, you know, if those who trained harder and more often were more rewarded. And I thought, why have I never really, you know, why have I never thought about that? Because I work in very black and white simple ways, which I'm trying to get away from. But yeah, def definitely had a huge impact in terms of my, my connection with the, with the boys. Did it affect, I guess, the culture that you were looking to create? I mean, we've, we've seen a lot, I guess, on changes in culture and sports psychology coming into you know, even grassroots football now. Um, but did it kind of determine any behaviours that you felt that the players could be more engaged with or that they could be more involved in the process of setting those behaviours that are an acceptable standard for your group on the basis of what you've seen as their, as their wants and needs from this process? Yeah, I think that um, any time that you can offer autonomy or, or tap into that self-determination with, with a, a group, whether it be a group of uh, young football players, a, a, a group of employees that you manage as a team, you know, that, um, the self-determination work is, is pretty robust. So, by, yeah, by offering that autonomy, I think, uh, and, and listening and acting on, I think that's the most important thing is that people, there's only one thing worse than not being listened to is being listened to and then not, not having anything done about it. So, um, yeah, I think, I, I don't. I can't remember the second part of your question there. Sure, I mean, mine was going off on a tangent. But um, you said, did you say something about systems? Just engaging, having them engaged in the process of setting the behaviours that you know are an acceptable standard within the group um, as part of this whole process to you know, develop an overarching culture that you want. I guess the group to really, really benefit from. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, we'd done some work. I had a coach who was on his uh, UEFA B uh, with me um, a couple of years ago now, and he he asked, could he could he come and coach to get some experience? So I kind of uh, brought him in, and I, I took uh, almost like an assistant coach's uh, back seat for for half a season or so. And one of the things that we did together there was um, ask the ask the boys, or we did a task with them to try and find out what what were the kind of core values of this team? So um, there's plenty of ways, I'm sure many that are much better and much more rigorous than what we did, but we just simply printed out a list of values, which is just kind of an exhaustive 
list of words and gave each of the players uh, this list and said, go away and come back to training next week in seven days' time and go through all these words, have a look at them at different times of the day and times of the week and just highlight which ones are important to you when you think about this team. And what we did was just really simply take collating, I think there was a squad about 16 then, and take in and just collate together and did a kind of little frequency analysis. You know, what were the most common words that were coming out? And um, the two the two most common words were um, loyalty and respect, which then, you know, a, a year or so down the line when we started asking about fairness and, and rules and things like that, well, if you're showing loyalty and respect and, and you're committing and working hard, well, what, you know, that's what you should be rewarded with in terms of opportunities to play. It's not to say that, you know, the people that perhaps miss a training session, who turn up and, you know, don't get on the pitch. That's, uh, I should make that abundantly clear. You know, we've still got some minimum parameters that we work by. So every, everyone gets you know, a minimum of a, a quarter of a game, for example. So if you haven't trained um, for a couple of weeks, you know, and you're still turning up, you're still going to get on the pitch and get, get a good 20 minutes. Um, but those who've worked hard and those who've committed and shown loyalty and respect, um, you know, should be rewarded with more. Good. Um, I guess this whole process, obviously it was a long-term process for you in terms of research. And, and, but what, are you, what is the plan to continue it as part of, I guess, development plans, goal setting for the season, even for individuals yeah. in a group? Well, the, um, the pandemic uh, has kind of, uh, I guess, got in the way a little bit because what we were, what I was hoping to do with a colleague of mine was to um, take this research further, to do more, more focus groups, to get more data and to then start to look at getting the paper published. So, the, the, you know, we've been told that the paper is, um, we could submit it to a, a journal now and they would probably publish it, depending on the journal, of course. But what we want to do is um, really try and understand and, and get some more depth and breadth to this. So, like I said at the start, it is you know it's a small sample. It's just a group of three three football teams in the northwest of England talking about you know football. You, you can't really generalise from this, but I think you know it can make you think a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll give the question and over to some others now, rather than asking my own questions. Um, so we had a question from Noel, and again, this is one that I find interesting because I think it's something that really needs to be looked at. Uh, the concept of playing down, I guess, and up is an interesting one. And I think alongside bio abandon, this can be a benefit. How, how do you think it can best be incorporated on a larger scale? And I guess within internal groups, if you're an organizational club with a lot of teams, is it something that could be done internally to, to manage that part of it? Yeah. Good question. So the the bio banding was something that I looked at in the research, and um, the there's some interesting stuff out there. So on the surface, I think and I, what I would do if you if this is something you're interested in, in have a, a read into a guy called Sean Cumming. Uh, I think he's down at the University of Bath, and he's done extensive research around around bio banding in a football context. But um, yeah, there was there was some uh, results that suggest. You know, on the surface of it, um, do we want uh, kids playing in competitive environments where they um, where they have a chance? Well, yes, they tell us that. But what they also uh, tell us is that playing with their friends is a really strong motivator. And there's and so there was a study done, I think, where they they had some players play um, in a biobanding uh, setting. Obviously, some of them were chronologically playing down and some of them were chronologically playing up, but biologically, they were on a more even playing field. And the, the, again, this is Cummings work, so I hopefully, Sean, that I don't butcher it, but um, the, the players found it interesting and a, and a different challenge, but they still valued playing with their own age group. And I think New Zealand have done something similar or tried to do something similar in um, a youth rugby setting. So they've they tried to incorporate biobanding because, you know, there's probably not too many sports where having a, a mismatch in physical maturation uh, has such a detrimental effect. So you, you could get a kind of, you know, six foot player in, let's say, under 13s playing against, you know, someone who's four foot. 
um, and and half the weight. So um, I think they I think they tried it in New Zealand, but the the bounce back effect was they um, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong on this, but I think what happened was more players started dropping out of youth rugby in New Zealand than they'd had experience previously because they were being forced to play in a situation where they were being split up from their friends. So it's adult intervention, again, done with, with the best of intentions, but there's unintended consequences to nearly every every action that, that we have. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's definitely worth exploring them. So biobanding, I think, is um, is useful uh, as a tool. I don't think it's a silver bullet, but I definitely think it shouldn't be taken off the table um, if we're going to look at alternative ways of providing healthy competition to, to young people. Do you think there's a, an age that this is really needed? not introduced, but it's not introduced before, I guess, be in maturation. It comes at different rates and different age groups. And, you know, obviously that's when things physically can change so quickly, but we cannot ignore the psychological development and mental development aspect of a kid who's still 12 months younger. He may be taller, but he's just emotionally immature because he's 12 months further behind in his development just in that sense. Um, yeah, and that, sorry, Sean, carry on. No, I guess, I guess that's the question in how we balance those two when it comes to things like fire banding and relative age effect because obviously we've all seen the results of that when it comes to elite level players and teams. Yeah, and I'm, look, I'm again certainly no expert in this field. There's plenty of them out there worth looking at, but yeah, I think the assumption that we can often make as coaches is that um, you know bigger equals more mature, but it, it, it's not as definitely not as straightforward or, or as simple as that. Um, and even you know within the, the the research groups that or the teams that I uh, interviewed for for this research, there was a clear um, distinction on. Oh, there was a clear difference in what people viewed as fair, uh, based on, I guess, their, you could say, on their maturation, on their playing maturation. So, the, those who were more mature as, as players in terms of they they play, um, tended to view fairness uh, on a bit more of a kind of nuanced scale than those who were um, playing, I guess less mature players, and I use that term very carefully, um, who just saw fairness in terms of playing up and playing down as black and white, yeah, yes, no, uh, you know, either it should or it shouldn't be. So I, I think there, there's something interesting in that in terms of the um, young people's maturation and, and how they view, you know, these what can be quite complicated issues that, you know, that they face. I think one way, I guess, around that, of your research kind of into being involved in asking the players the questions rather than like I said parental intervention adult intervention can cause that just to happen but taking the viewpoint and perspective of what the child player wants into it can determine whether that's something that's going to like I said, instead of wanting to play with their friends they want to be challenged is there a balance between the two that we need to you know, take their feedback and make their parents feedback on before we make those decisions yeah, definitely. Um, and this is where a little bit where I feel for, you know, those of you so out in the States who are based in the more rural areas, because you're, I, you've got, there's certainly opportunity to be more creative with the way that you, you um, uh, build competition. But I, you know, I, I know of the problems of having to travel out of town and out of state just to find a decent game. So, look, I'm talking from a really privileged position where we're, we're in the, the northwest of England is the most densely populated network of professional football on planet Earth. So, you know, you could go down the road 20 minutes and find 20 different professional clubs. Um, so it is it, that and that provides us with, with much more opportunity to keep friends together and have enough teams in the local area to organise a good competitive game or division or competition whatever that may be um but it, yeah wherever you are i don't, I don't think it, it should mean that we should stop listening to to the young people and um and, and find out more about what they want from the experience definitely and rob's asked a question about in the us we have a pay to pay model outside of the elite academy environments and so when you talk about competitive and non-competitive development against winning 
with a lot of coaches in this environment are battling the parents and their I guess cultural mindset in terms of winning is more important than development so how do you foresee that being navigated yeah I, well firstly i think that we should stop putting these two things on on a on a scale that are at opposite ends of each other because they're not um you, you and i think we should try and wrestle with this a little bit more and start looking at um you know developing through winning and winning through development uh, rather than you know, almost thinking that whatever decision I make, I'm uh, oh I'm a, I'm a developmental coach or I'm a winning coach because it just leads to this nonsensical tribalism that is really really not helpful in, in youth sport. So, but I do understand uh, and I do get and empathise with a lot of the people. And the, I think one of the problems that we've got and you guys have got is the pay um, the, the incremental pay and play model. Uh, it's almost turned the it's turned the relationship into a transactional one, whereby Sean, you're a parent of uh, and your son plays for my team. You know, you're paying top dollar to to send your son. You know, and and you and, and this is typical of, of cultures. You know, you want outcomes, and often you know the outcomes that you want and. Um, are easier, easiest viewed in terms of black and white. You know, what's what's the scoreline? What's the balance sheet say? And we've got to start shifting that. And and I think, you know, we've we've swung the pendulum quite a lot the other way, where we've we're going right. We can't have scorelines anywhere. We can't publish results. And and I don't. I know that can have a an, a, an impact. But there's there's some cultures that have kind of found. I think a bit more of a middle ground where the adults just understand that. It's healthy to win, and it's healthy to lose, um, and it's it's healthy to throw away a lead, and 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 experience that, and it's it and it's healthy to come back and draw, and it, and actually your your football experience should be a little bit like your education, <clears throat> broad and varied, you know. Um, I see that there's plenty of teams around here, and I'm sure there are where you are, who who win every game, and uh, the adults often really enjoy that and the the time when they maybe don't win a game or they lose a game the behaviors that i witness are extreme to say the least and it's because they haven't you know those players and those adults perhaps their their football experience hasn't been you know particularly balanced it's almost like they've chosen one subject from uh, the start of school and and only done that subject all the way through and they haven't maybe necessarily um develop the, the the skills to cope with these different situations because you know let's let's face it if we're in this to develop professional players in in our own setting unless of course you're working in in an academy in which case things may be slightly different but the odds the odds are against us so we've got to think about actually what are the longer term aims for me personally I, you know i don't want to impose this necessarily on anyone but my, my long-term aim is to make sure that the boys that I coach, you know, they're 16 now, but how great would it be if they're still playing when they're 36, 46, 56, 66 even, you know? If I've done enough to keep them in the game for the rest of their lives, you know, hopefully by helping them to enjoy the game and, dare say, improve a little bit, then, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. But it, it's about keeping that long-term aim at the front all the time. You, um, I guess when we're talking about that connection between parents and players and, and coaches, especially, I guess, in the younger age groups, when we're trying, I guess, form that level of goal setting, those targets, those long-term outcomes, do you think the communication of those is probably the most important aspect so they don't get those unrealistic expectations, like instead of winning every game, if they lose a game, it's the end of the world. So we can keep them enjoying the game and be appropriately challenged and, and developing. Yeah, well... I mean, what do you think about that? Do you, at what age group do you coach? Um, I work for the last two years with the younger U9 through U12, so the foundation phase kids. And now I'm technical director of the club here that has U9 through U15. Um, yeah. So seeing a different range, and I work with Dynamo Academy kids, the youngest age group we did the game. And when they lost the game, it was the end of the world. I feel we built a level of trust and understanding with the parents in terms of the understanding. So the parents understood the kids got upset because they hadn't lost a lot of games. Parents kind of understood that this wasn't the end of the world, that they'd seen the development over two years and they wanted that to continue. 
um, and understanding that the players, our sole aim is to get the players to fall in love with the game. So when they have to choose or they don't want to play anymore, they choose football, they choose soccer instead of choosing the American sports, baseball, basketball, football, which is a huge competition level for us here. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, and th well, this probably goes back to what were the things that I got out of the original re you know, research um, was an appreciation for, um, you know, just what these young people value from from competition. And like I've said, um, yeah, winning is enjoyable, but only when you've had to work hard to achieve it. So if you've if you've won easy. It's really not enjoyable, and and actually, and and this is one thing I would say: if you are tasked with, well, all of us, I guess, who work in a youth setting, are tasked with having a relationship with the parents of those that we coach. Um, well, firstly, it, it is a relationship, and it's a relationship that is built on often us having to influence. And what I've found is that if you want to influence somebody, you, you need to have a, a good relationship with them, a positive relationship with them. So I, I guess if that if we're talking dominoes, that would be the lead domino is have that good relationship with the parents in the first place. Um, and that might be fine, a, finding a common ground. You might not agree on everything, but it's all, I think it's all right to disagree on, on things. In fact, it's quite healthy, which is why I, I you know, asked a lot of you to, to disagree with something you know, that I said tonight. Um, but have the relationship. Once you've got a good relationship, you can influence. And then um, I, just remembering that they want challenge. Challenge is more important than, to the young, these young people than winning often. Now, not for everyone. And there, there will be outliers and, and you will probably coach players where you know, they will have been brought up that it is winning at all costs. But I bet it's not all, not all of them. And I, and I bet if you dug deep enough, they, you would start to explore just how much they value the struggle and, um, tr you know, trying to rise to the occasion, if you like. Um, but you, you, you don't know until you start having these conversations. Um, did this, I guess, the challenge aspect inform your training methods in terms of, being sure that there was always that appropriate challenge in every in every session that you run, um, especially if you knew that you were kind of against a team that maybe wouldn't use such a challenge at the weekend, and that's what the players craved. Yeah, well, we we don't have that problem really because um, the team that I coach, we we we've, we've been one of the uh, the teams with the kind of uh, less favourable win loss record for quite a few. Ever since we moved to eleven aside, we we fell victim of the um, the late birthday effect. So. We've been gradually playing keep up, catch up ever since. But the weird thing is, although you know, I think at under 14s we probably had a um, in a in the regular season we maybe had a minus 100 goal difference, and yet we were we were still getting more and more players asking, could we come and join? Players from teams who were winning. So I don't I don't think I'm a particularly good technical coach, um, but through my own experiences as a player their age, I, I probably figured out more about what I didn't enjoy about uh, training more than what I did. And so those experiences I've used to shape, you know, what I think is a, uh, a motivating and enjoyable climate in, in training. So I, maybe, you know, my views around um, training and practice, you might call it, haven't changed so much because that's something that I've, I believed in for quite a while now um, that you know that my job is to go out and work with coaches and to educate and develop coaches on um, on training sessions. So I've probably seen you know my quite a lot of uh, coaching sessions live compared to you know your average human. So I, I, I you get that kind of sense of consistent things that seem to motivate and work well um, across a spectrum of players, whether that be working with a, you know, a seven-year-old uh, who's just started or a 27-year-old, um, you know, who's making a living out of the game. The, the sort of things that motivate those aren't a million miles apart, to be honest with you. And, and often they, they look and feel like what well, is play at a weekend, which is the match. Someone's asked, do you think that, Having this process 
for coaches as well would be beneficial because it's why are we not doing the same thing with coaches in the restricted system and the qualification process and the increasingly restricted systems of certification. Um, yeah, so is that, sorry, I just, I lost you for that for a sec there, Sean. Um, let me just see if I can, uh, yeah. Um, so what was the question, should we be doing this, this research yeah. with coaches? Why are we not doing the same with coaches within the English coaching system in terms of the qualification process and the increasingly restricted system of certification? Uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. So I know that there's obviously within our, Ed, coach education system there is um i guess minimum requirements in order to get onto a, a level so for example I'm, I'm assuming this coach might be talking about a ua for b or an advanced youth award so there's certain requirements in order to get onto the next level um is is that the question sean i'm not i'm trying to find um, it on the on the screen yes yeah, it's, 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 it's one says it's great that we're now listening to the participants in youth sport to help develop better ways of communicating with them and changing their adult thoughts on how youth sports should be run. Why are we not doing the same with coaches? Uh, I've got you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, I guess where we're going in terms of an association is uh, personalised and collect, uh, connected learning experiences. That's you know, what, in terms of us at FA education, with an FA hat on now, that's, that's where we're going. Um, what this coronavirus has done is kind of speed up uh, our thinking on that. So I think what what education globally is waking up to is that there is um, uh, there is alternate methods out there. You know, I've been listening to some a lot of interesting stuff from uh, higher education institutions, looking at how are they a providing education now, but b how are they going to adapt to to the future. Um, and there's, I think I'm quite excited about it. There's not much I can kind of say on a live webinar to a, a hundred plus coaches, but all that I know. But what I think will happen is that um, we'll begin to see a, a coach education system that is um, much more personalised in terms of. So, Sean, you, you know, you might log on to Netflix after we uh, after we finish this conversation. And Netflix will give you, it's really good at this, you know, it will give you all the content that it thinks is relevant for you. I think that what we want to do is move towards a coach education system that isn't so um, linear and that isn't so, uh, what would be the word, um, uh, I guess, e equal in terms of everyone receiving the same content at the same time. We've got an opportunity now, or we're, we're, we're starting to take the opportunity to hit pause and think how could coach education be more personalized uh, and connected in, in the future. So I think that that's, I hope that answers uh, the question anonymous attendee. Um, but that is certainly where, where the thinking is at, at the moment and, and the direction of travel that, that we're heading. Um, it's quite exciting actually. I think that that can be facilitated by, I guess, a mentor where an individual coach educator has the ability to kind of learn. We know how to coach players because we learn about players and we know what our words, our decisions will affect them. You know, a coaching education forum, maybe you don't have that luxury. Apart from yep. if it's a so, more individual basis. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry, Sean. It, it sounded like you, uh, you're underwater a little bit there. You keep going quiet, but I think I picked up the, the quiet. It sounds like you, your microphone's covered. Um, I, th I think I got the gist of the question. Uh, yeah, and in, in, in a, a nutshell, I would say uh, yes. What, what we've done is move our coach education oh, since 2016 to a more um, bespoke, well, I guess, in situ based so previously um we would you know you you would come along you, you've probably done some of the uh qualifications yourself have you sean what have you done some of the english ones i did the first every level one before i moved out here and i've done the u.s licensing since i've been here okay so uh i'll give an example i did my ua for b in 2006 and i'll never forget it so the um we did the uh, I think nine days straight of content. We went away, completed a portfolio of work. And then in the summer months, I think it was June, hottest day of the year, we came back 
and we all um, participated in um, a weekend's worth of assessments. So I would play in um, except like most of the sessions because I could run around back then. Uh, and then I would, I would go and coach a couple of sessions. <clears throat> and so we all knew each other as, as coaches, but we didn't, we were all, you know, we had ex pros and people who hadn't played the game for 30 years all on the same pitch. Um, so what we've tried to do, you know, there was there's some great benefits to that. You know, those those people, there's, there's still a good number of people that I met on that course that I'm still in touch with now. And some have, have, have risen to some really lofty positions in the game. So you know, it, it's great that you can make those connections on coach education courses, which I would urge anyone that does do a, a course face to face or, or online is to, if, you know, to connect with, with your other learners. Um, what we've done now is move towards so Sean if you were if you were on your UA for B with us here in Liverpool mm -hmm. you you might well be in my kind of cohort and then I, I can spend a much more focused amount of time with you throughout the season so I would come out and, and see you three times and work with you a minimum of three times uh, it might be that you're you train on the pitch that's just around the corner from our, the house here so I'd mic you up film you um, and then we would uh, we would send you that video and you would then be given the chance to kind of reflect on your own coaching and then what that would lead is to a more bespoke and um, individual discussion between you and I so the the boundary I guess our relationship is is one more of a you, you mentioned mentor mentee potentially um, it, it moves towards more of a, a coach development relationship than just a pure assessor um, and, and so we've, we've been on that path for nearly four years now. And I think that as technology improves, um, you know, I can only see that, um, that, you know, was going further down that, uh, that rabbit hole because, you know, there's no reason, Sean, why you couldn't send me a video of you coaching you know, la the last time you coached, whenever that was, maybe a couple of months ago, um, you know, you, we've all got the technology in our pockets now for you to film your session. You could ping it over to me, um, you know, uh, taking advantage of the time zones. By the time that you wake up the next morning, you could have some critical feedback on, on your own coaching. And there's no reason why people on, on the call here couldn't, couldn't do that um, amongst themselves. One of the things that you seem to be, I guess, most valuable when it comes to helping these coaches develop, I mean, I've always looked at it and kind of over the last year looked more at self-reflection as being the most valuable tool for getting feedback and, and advice from more senior and, and coaches who are further along in their journey has been incredibly valuable. In this last four years since you've changed that, have you seen a change in the behaviour of coaches that you've worked with or that the coaches that have gone through the process, do you see now a difference in them because of it? Yeah. So, what what did you say you preferred? Did you say you preferred the feedback or the self reflection, or what? What was your where were your views on it at the moment? I found self reflection to be the most valuable tool, um, but then it's right. always good to get that either confirmed in terms of my views were yeah. or to be challenged on them. I guess. Yeah. But I think if you can take the time to self reflect, then that's the most valuable time as a as a coach to improve yourself. Yeah, I think it probably depends on your knowledge base at the start. So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have been doing some um, online training by, uh, and he won't mind me mentioning him his name because it's free advertising for him, but a guy called Keith Daniel owns a company called The Media Group and they do um, presentation. Uh, they, they set up a lot of the events that we run at St. George's Park. They kind of do all the, the lighting and what have you. Now, Keith's got a background in, media training so he's been doing some uh some training with us where we've been on a zoom call uh we've had to present i, I had to do a one minute present presentation on the vegetables that i've got growing out in the garden behind me um and then get some feedback so my my knowledge and understanding of presenting is at uh, a level but keith's is of you know a, a much higher level so you know in that respect feedback would be is going to be really useful for me and as a professional presenter which you know I've said I don't think I am um, that's quite useful but I think the more that we can shift coaches towards 
are not having to rely on feedback and asking themselves more critical questions and having the honesty to face what you know can be often uncomfortable answers I think the better and that that's one thing that I try to do with the coaches that I work with you know in, in qualifications or otherwise is to um, you know the video doesn't hide anything um, it, it's it's a very useful tool to start some discussions especially when you add a little timestamp to the corner so what I'll often do is I'll sit with my stool and my headphones on and I'll be watching you, but I'll have stopped or started the stopwatch off in front of the GoPro. And I, I'm just listening for what I would call critical moments in the session and just make a note of them. But then what I'll ask you to do is, okay, when you get in the car on the way home, just have a think of, instead of putting the radio on, just keep it off and just think about what were the critical moments in that session for you. And whatever they, whatever they are, good, bad, indifferent, even if those are the right labels, but what stuck out, just note them down. You could do it on your voice notes, it, you could do it on a piece of paper and a pen, but just note down those, those, those key moments and what stuck out for them. And then what I found that that is a really good jumping point for us to then have a discussion. So you and I might jump on a Zoom call or meet up in person okay, what, what were your key moments? Okay, 20, uh, there was this point around 25 minutes. Okay, so we'll skip to that in the video. Let's watch that back and let's, you know, pause and discuss if it's something technical in nature. Then we can always rewind and look at what the players are doing, what can you see? And I think that um, it, it's, it's certainly give, given me as a coach developer much more opportunities to... Um, do things that I've never had the chance to do before. And even, you know, I'm talking only six or seven years ago um, that, you know, just by finding creative ways to use the technology to, you know, with the end goal in mind of you becoming a more critical thinking coach uh, rather than just kind of using technology for the sake of it, you know, for, you know, something that looks up is pretty. Have you found that when you've been working with coaches, their mindset coming in, determines a little bit how responsive they are to that feedback and the process. You know, we talk a lot about growth mindset and things nowadays as they're the people who are most inclined towards success because they're most less, more resilient to failure, I guess you would say. Great point, yeah. Um, I do. And I think it goes back to, to, there's a lot of parallels with the coach-parent relationship. So if, if you don't trust me or if you don't think that I've got your best intentions at heart as a coach developer um i've got no chance in terms of in making any realistic long-term you know behavior changes in you as a coach so the the the, the skill set of a coach developer is is actually becoming or when you when you look at it it's quite broad you've got to have the the subject knowledge you, you you've got to be a kind of a generalist in a, in a lot of areas so you've got to have the subject knowledge of not just the game, but all the different ologies that if you like. And then you've also got to be able to um, quickly establish credibility and relationships with people that, you know, have maybe decades of experience in the game at, you know, in some respects, the top level. So that, that can be quite a challenge sometimes. Um, but, it's a good one. If you, you know, if you truly, if you truly want to make the game better, then you know it's up to me to, to develop those relationships and that trust. That lead into, I guess, players as well. When you're coaching your own group, um, has it helped to develop players with more of an open and growth mindset and more leaders within your group because I guess they feel empowered throughout this process of of being engaged in the goal setting and and their voices being heard aspect. Yeah, that's interesting, actually, because um, I wonder if I can dig it out. I, I was at the UK coaching conference last summer. Um, it was at Loughborough University, and one of the presenters put up something, and it was a it was a really useful slide. I'll, I'll try and dig it up and send it um, to you. But basically, it, it was a quick questionnaire that you could um, ask your players uh, to find out... Um, almost like a barometer of the, the motivational climate. So I, I thought, 
the, the poor boys I coached, they, they're almost like a, a testing ground. But I thought this, this is really interesting. So I sent it out to them. And what I got back was that um, overall, the, the motivational climate was quite empowering. I was really pleased with that. But one of the things that I, I clearly didn't do was to um, in, encourage the boys to ask enough questions. So that's something that I've, I've tried to do is not just get feedback, but to ask more questions and ask better questions. So I, I think I can probably find it um, somewhere in, in my photos. I took a photo of it, but um, yeah, that, that was that was quite a, a piece of feedback. Yeah, I've got it here. So uh, I can probably put this on the screen here. I don't know if you can see that. Is that coming up? It's, um, it's staying up on the, the way your eyes very small because your screen is still being shared. Ah, well, that doesn't really help, does it? So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh it's five questions and uh, i'm sure you can pick this up off the recording but um, number one is uh, i give my athletes uh choices and options and then it's a range from strongly disagree to strongly agree on five points um i answer my athletes questions fully and carefully so that was the one that i actually scored badly on or scored the word and i say badly it was like i think three or four out of five so what I realized was it it wasn't that I didn't answer the boys' questions, is that I didn't get enough questions from them. So I, it, what that then encouraged me to do was, you know, empower them to to um, to have a voice and a choice and to, and to challenge me in, in, in a respectful way, obviously. Um, but, you know, give me give me some questions that I can answer. So that, that's that been a really good one. Uh, the third one was, uh, when I ask my athletes to do something, I try to explain why this will be good to do so. Um, number four, it is important my athletes, it is important to my athletes, sorry, let me restart that one. It is important my athletes do their sport because they enjoy it. And the fifth one is, it's important that my athletes participate because they really want to. So there, there's five questions um, that you can give to the players that you coach to almost get a little bit of a, a yardstick on, um, you know, where the climate is right now. And, and if you want me, I, I can I can send you a screenshot of that um, that, that I'm sure you could ping out. I think that would be great. Do you think that's yeah. something that coaches could use proactively? You know, that these are my use... targets. They're using proactively. So they get these questions at the start of the season. These are my targets for the season. And I'm going to see how I've done at the end of three-month period. I'm going to ask the co this is what I want to do. Let's ask the kids after three months, have I managed to achieve this? In their, in their mind yeah absolutely and do you know what um that if we're talking about how winning and development and outcomes and in a target driven like western societies that we live in what what are some useful metrics that we can hang our hat on and work towards that is a really good starting point um so yeah i, I would fully agree so almost taking a, a, a score or a snapshot of where where we are at the start of the season mm -hmm. let's uh, let's work towards and let's review it I fully agree with that Sean I think that would be um, a much better way of shifting the focus away from the, the the one outcome that is really way outside of any individual's grasp and that's that's the score in the league table yeah, I think that'd be something that coaches can use to have set their own targets and players can maybe be aware of them at the start of the season. So it's certainly something that, I mean, I yeah. would find that super beneficial. I know our coaches would. Um, some last question, I guess, because, you know, it's, you know, we've all kept you long enough, I think, Jack. Got the barbecue um, on. But Chris has asked, and I think this is something that's come up again pretty recently in a lot of um, different, I guess, sports like kind of areas. How important is the use of language when talking to players? Yeah. This one specifically asked about moving players down, but any kind of language that is used when, when interacting with players, I think is something coaches need to be very conscious of. I would agree. Uh, and I'll give an example. Um, I, there's a lot of talk around uh, NLP, and I, it's not something that I particularly subscribe to. However, um, so when I got some feedback on my uh, vegetables presentation, the uh, Keith gave me some uh, feedback. Um, so he said, uh, you did this, this and this well. And then he said, but, and then suddenly gave me everything else. And so what 
why all I listened to was the 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 negative, I guess, the critical stuff, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's uh, it, it's yeah, how sometimes subtly your your language um, is what we as adults often think is maybe a throwaway comment or uh, doesn't get noticed. I think with from experience with younger players, younger people, they they pick up on absolutely everything. They've got such a finely tuned radar, um, which makes evolutionary sense, I think, when you think about it in terms of having the ability to survive within a group and to fit in. So uh, this this process has definitely made me much more considerate about my own language to the point actually where sometimes it's got a bit detrimental and I've almost had paralysis by analysis where I'm almost, you know, overthinking what I want to say and then ended up, end up just freezing. So like with anything, there's a balance to be had, but I think if we can just be more um, understanding and appreciative of the impact that our words often have or or do have, um, then it's going to make us a better coach. I 100% agree. And from my perspective, Jack, this has been incredibly interesting. And there's a lot of stuff I think everyone who is here can take from it. Um, I certainly appreciate your time. Um, I hope everyone here also did. Um, yeah, I've, I've got, I've actually just got the screenshot here. Oh. If you want me to pop it into, I'll pop it into the chat. Um, yeah, go ahead. This is a, a test of my tech here, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's a, it is a photo that I took from, uh, from Loughborough. Let's see if that works. Uh, give me two secs. Um, just uh, there we go. Uh, if I say good screenshot of that and then pop that in here, is there a way of adding a, a document or is it drag and drop in this? I've never done it, so you're, Sorry, you're so Sean. <laughs> We're getting there. Um, desktop screenshot. Mm, doesn't seem to be. Oh, give it one go. I think I might have it then. There we are. Did that come up. I'll tell you what I'll do. I, is that, I don't know if that's come up or not, but I, what I'll do if it didn't work, I will. Um, I'll send it to you, Sean, and then. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure you can send it out with any other documents that you want to you want to send it to. Yeah, I, if you send it across to me, I'll, um, I'll send a follow up to everyone on the call who attended and um. And start it. Great. So, well, um, yeah. I mean, thanks for having me. <laughs> and, no, it was uh, a pleasure. Th- thanks to everyone who uh, who tuned in from wherever you were on the globe, and I hope you're all um, safe and sound, and looking forward to getting back to some sort of football at some point whenever it returns. Thanks, Jack. And um, everyone who's on and who's still around, we've got Thomas Gronemark, Liverpool's throwing coach, joining us on Thursday. And we've got another three sessions next week for anyone who's interested. But, um, keep your eyes peeled for that information, guys. And thank you again. And Jack, thank you. Everyone else, enjoy the rest of your day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thanks, guys.